And I've been known to take a lot of wipeouts. I was always put it all on the line. I would just put it as deep as humanly possible. The maximum consequence for the ultimate ride. Like if you make it, it's the best ride of your life. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest fashion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast would literally not be possible without the support of our sponsor, Blue Blocks. Blue Blocks offers a complete range of evidence-backed blue light blocking glasses to suit your every need, and they also look really cool. Their signature sleep lenses block 100% of the blue and green light from the 400 to 550 nanometer range, giving you optimal melatonin release and the best sleep ever. They also have daytime blue light glasses for when you're working on a computer or recording a podcast like this. Often I use the yellow lenses because I don't want it to get too dark and I don't want to get too tired. I don't want to produce too much melatonin because I need to work here in the studio on the computer. So I kind of have like different blue blocks for all different times of the day. But after say eight, nine o'clock at night, then I'm rocking the darker kind of amber color lenses in the 550 range because I want to get tired and start winding down and going to sleep. They offer a full range of non-prescription, prescription, and readers with free worldwide shipping. They also have a really cool service where you can send in your own frames, which is dope. So you might have some great sunglasses, which I don't recommend wearing personally. It's a whole other topic. Uh, I don't wear sunglasses myself, but I have turned some of my other sunglasses into blue blockers, which is really cool. So I would highly recommend if you care about your sleep and you want some good looking blue blocking eyewear to protect yourself from computers and lights at night and all that kind of stuff, get yourself over to blueblocks.com. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. And when you get there, at checkout, enter the code LIFESTYLIST and save 15% off. Yo, I am super pumped to share with you beekeepersnaturals.com. Now, if you heard episode 175 with founder and CEO Carly Stein, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are the highest quality bee products in the world from Beekeepers Naturals. Now, I've been using bee products for a long time. Back in the 90s, I was rocking like the bee pollen and, and you know, using kind of gourmet honey over the years and things like that. But until that interview, honestly, I had no idea of the superpowers and the variety of different bee products. So not only do these guys make the cleanest, most organic, most potent bee products, they also have the widest variety of products. So whether it's propolis, which helps you with the immune system, Um, soothing scratchy throats. It's really potent stuff. Or the bee pollen, which is a superfood with vitamins and nutrients and gives you energy. It has amino acids and protein, whether it's the raw honey, the royal jelly. Uh, They even have a tonic for your brain. I mean, they have a lot of great products over there. So if you're not hip to the power of bee products as a superfood, I want to highly recommend that you get over to beekeepersnaturals.com And honestly, if you want to just learn all about bees in the industry and how it's done and how it's done right for ecology and for the environment, definitely go back and listen to episode 175. It's a it's a great episode. And the founder Carly is just brilliant and she's running a really great operation over there. So I'm very happy to support them on the show. And uh, like all the stuff I always talk about, I use them every day. In fact, I use it too much because I run out of it. Like when I interviewed her, I was like, so I do like a couple tablespoons of the bee powered, which is the really potent one that combines all of the superfoods in the hive into one product. She's like, dude, the dose for that is half a teaspoon once a day. You're tripping. But, you know, I'm hardcore Uh, because it just tastes delicious and it gives you like instant energy. So definitely get over to beekeepersnaturals.com. When you're there, if you enter the code LIFESTYLIST, that's one word, LIFESTYLIST, you'll save 15% off your order. So go to beekeepersnaturals.com, enter the code LIFESTYLIST. 
surf is up, folks. Today's guest is world champion big wave surfer Garrett McNamara and his daughter, for that matter, who you'll likely hear chiming in during our chat. Here's the lowdown on this conversation. We talk about Garrett's insanely wild book, Hound of the Sea, a tale of his really trippy life uh, that led him into his stardom in sports his rough childhood and how that contributed to his determination to succeed, what it's like to surf tsunami waves from caving glaciers in Alaska, how he broke the world record for the largest wave ever of 78 feet. Can you imagine? Do you know how high 78 feet is? That's like, I don't know, eight stories or something. It's nuts. Uh, He surfed that at uh, Nazare, Portugal. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's, you know, it's Portuguese. So there's the little thing over the E. I'm guessing if you speak Portuguese, you know, don't shoot me. I'm doing my best. We also talk about his first big wave experience and how it helped shape his worldview. Then we talk about the biggest wave he ever surfed and what it was like to face the fear of death and how he got over it. The history of surfing and the first humans on record to do it. The epic tale of getting smashed by a 50 foot wave at Mavericks. His relationship with pain and how to get through it. When to rely on Western medicine versus Eastern philosophies of healing, his top biohacks to recover from injuries, the moment he stopped being afraid of big waves, the key to ridiculously long breath holds. I think this guy could hold his breath for half a podcast and still finish it. It's insane. And he's going to teach you how. His deep relationship with the sea and why he connects so profoundly with the element of water. And finally, managing the risks he takes as an athlete with the love he has for his family. Really happy to deliver this episode to you. I'd love for you to join the newsletter, man. I'm really proud of the new show notes. We've got complete transcripts. We've got tons of links. The show notes are now timestamped. They are really useful if you're someone that wants to actually take away and use the information presented in podcasts like this. The Luke Story newsletter is bomb, dude. I I just have to say, I know it's mine. You know, I don't want to brag. I don't make it. My my production team does, but it was my idea to put some extra time, energy, and money into it just for you because I want it to be high value and very useful to you. To join the newsletter, it is super easy. Go to lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. That's lukestory.com forward slash newsletter. I know, listen, it's a pain in the ass to stop the podcast, open up your browser, da, 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 do the thing, but just trust me, you're going to dig it. If you don't, you can unsubscribe. If you don't want to use your browser, actually, I can make it even easier. If you have a US phone, you can just text me to the number 44222. So open your text app, text 44222. That's the number. In the body of the text, put the word lifestylist, all one word, click send, and you're going to get a prompt to enter your name and email, and you're done. But seriously, the newsletters are rad. They come out every Tuesday, and there's so much value in them that I don't want you to miss it. Okay, now let's get ready to ride this massive wave of an interview with the big wave master himself, Mr. Garrett McNamara. Here we are, man. We're off the wave on a chair. How's it feel to be on dry land? So it's just another wave. <laughs> yeah, it sure is, isn't it? <laughs> more, a little more intense. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess out there to some people would be intense, but to you, perhaps real life might be more intense if that's where you find your flow. A little more challenging to navigate for sure. So I'm going to jump right in here. Um, tell us about the new documentary that I've caught wind of. What What's the status of that? Um, the, we got super... Lucky, um, well, unlucky. I, I guess you shouldn't say unlucky. I, I injured my shoulder pretty good and hadn't been back, really back, for three years. And uh, went to Indonesia, did a month of yoga, forest yoga, three hours a day, like the most intense, amazing, transformational yoga I've ever experienced. My wife was taking the teacher's training. And uh, then we went to go have some fun after a month of yoga, and I break my foot. On the way to Portugal, we're filming the documentary. The documentary is about um, my partner, Andrew Cotton, my brother-in-law, CJ Macias, and, uh, and I, our, our injuries that we've had. And we've been told not to go back to giant waves or, or um, not a good idea. For me, they said I probably should never serve big, probably won't be able to is what they told me. 
Um, Cody, I don't think his, his injuries ever slowed him down. CJ definitely was not interested. So both of us overcoming our injuries and, and um, going back to Nazareth, surfing the biggest waves in the world. And uh, just, just showcasing that everything's possible. And uh, sharing more about the ocean and the water and the challenges is what we were, we're hoping the movie to be more about. Um, we got Chris, uh, Joe Lewis, the producer. He was a co-founder of Amazon. He came in as a producer. And then uh, Chris Smith, just at Fire Festival. He came in as the director. And... I'm pretty sure it's going to pretty much go that way. But when a director gets a hold of it, he has his ideas and he's such an amazing director that I trust the, his judgment and where he wants to take it. But right now, I really don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good sign as long as you have the right people that know the vision, you know. But I, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be cool. So I just I wanted to start off with that because this will be coming out in early... Uh, first quarter of 2020 so we could probably hope that that's going to come to fruition next year in 2020 you think yeah but they want to get it knocked out this this winter but it, it could go into next winter if we don't get a giant wave this winter it was going to end with a giant wave unless it right. ends some unless they find a different ending which it's they they, they t it was um the road to nazare was the working title that we presented to them with the story and then uh it turned into the hundred foot wave, and we're just like, okay, hundred foot. Wave. Yeah, everything in life is a hundred foot wave. I just approach life that way. I work on being that happy and that excited about everything I get myself into. Like I'm riding the hundred foot wave right now with you. So you just gotta envision yourself just ah, having the best day of your life on the biggest, best, most biggest wave of your life all day every day <laughs> so you like most people I find that are achievers and have accomplished great things in life uh, if not most many had a pretty rough childhood how do you think that's contributed to your striving to break records and achieve success in your chosen field you know I, I people have been touching on that lately and I, I just I find myself thinking back wondering and thinking what it did it really and it definitely uh made me i had to work for everything nothing was given to us my brother and i both we had to and we didn't have to scrap and fight and want to be the best but we chose to and uh i have friends that were that i looked up to as a young surfer and they were like light years, they surf in circles around me. And since we took the approach of just being so hungry and never giving up and having to just make it happen or nothing's going to happen. I'm 52 years old and my career is better than it's ever been. And the guys that I really looked up to their careers ended at like 25. So it's, it's really a, it definitely helped me be more, um, I get hungry and focused, focused. I, I was always really focused on my big wave sessions and the year I had to achieve something, I had to accomplish something or I might not get a check. I might not get a, another contract. So I was really focused on achieving something great every year. Were you ever uh, tempted to go to, you know, abusing drugs and alcohol as a way to deal with some of the negative experiences that you, that you had growing up? And, and especially in Hawaii, I know many people from Hawaii have you know, gone down that path because it's prevalent in certain circles there. The, we, you know, in Hawaii, you, you're with the boys and we, my brother and I, we hung with older guys. So started out smoking a lot of pot, having a blast smoking pot. And they always say, oh yeah, pot's the gateway. And I'm like, I don't know, gateway. And then all of a sudden somebody shows up with some white powder and all of a sudden you're doing that. And then, and it's fun. And it's no, it wasn't, we weren't trying to, I don't feel I was trying to escape anything ever. I feel that it was just there and it would just hang out with the wrong people. And then you start down to these different roads and, and, uh, then all of a sudden it can get a hold of you and, and it, it might not let you go unless you make a really valiant effort to get away. And yeah, I, I definitely had some challenges and it wasn't, uh, when it's, when it's not fun anymore. It's ugly, and that's when you definitely you don't you don't ever want to go down that road because 
that could go ugly. What's it like to surf a tsunami wave created by a caving glacier? <laughs> I find that to be one of the most fascinating things you've done. That was the craziest, uh, maybe dumbest. Um, again, trying to accomplish something that nobody's done and, and, uh, but they uh, be nice and, uh, you know, um, keep making a name for myself, keep my sponsors happy, get new contracts. I mean, the focus of that was, uh, to surf a wave that was generated from a different force other than a low pressure system that we can predict and we can see where that low pressure system is and how strong the winds are blowing, when the swell will arrive and how big the swell will be and what direction the wind will be. But with the glacier, it's 300 foot glacier looming over you and you're 50 feet away from it, waiting for it to crumble and break off. And if it, if it like uh, just detaches and plunges straight in, it makes a nice wave. But if it goes flat, you're dead. So it wasn't, wasn't really a good idea, but it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> so you're kind of waiting. I want to just picture the mechanics of this. Be nice. So you're kind of waiting out there. You're kind of waiting out there in a boat or, or what? I mean, how far away are you from the glacier as you're, as okay, you're watching this happen? So we started out about uh, 300 yards away from it, safe distance. And then we tried, and we're, uh, there's a jet ski and then a safety ski and then a tow rope. So I'm on the tow rope sitting in the water or my partner Kaylee's on the tow rope and one of us is driving and we see it starting to crumble and see it where it's going to break off and okay, it's going to fall. There's not going to go flat. It's going to come straight in. Okay. 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 When it starts falling and you drive straight out and then try and throw the guy at the wave and we were getting there too late. It was already over by the time we got there. So then we got about 50 feet away from it and we're just sitting, I'm on the rope, he's on the ski or he's on the ski and I'm on the rope and this thing is looming over us and we're waiting for it to fall and we're hoping it falls properly and doesn't crush us. And the first wave that we towed at, it, it was uh, this it, perfect plunge in and this little mountain rises and he tows me at it and I'm on the perfect spot. He throws me at it it doesn't really break. It's more of a swell, like about five, six feet tall. And I'm riding this swell. And I'm like, yeah, wow. So glassy and so smooth and so beautiful. And then all of a sudden I look up and I process the thought of it bookshelfing right there. Bookshelf is when it falls flat and turns into the biggest bomb. And uh, it's like the biggest shotgun in the world. Just, But if we're 50 feet away. It's going to, we're squashed. So I envisioned getting squashed by the next calving glacier. And the uh, fear that I encountered was so overwhelming. And I, I had put the whole crew together. I got the sponsors. I got, I was helped. I was part of the production. Uh, all this money was on the line that I was, I was uh, involved. It was, I was very involved in the project and I was like, I'm done. I'm throwing the towel. But I'm out of here. I went back, called my wife. I'm crying on the phone. And uh, my partner, Kaylee, is a big Hawaiian guy. He actually talked me through it and said, just relax. Just go to sleep and we'll wake up in the morning. There's only two hours of uh, dark. Two hours of... Um, it's only dark for two hours and it's not really dark. So it was really... The whole thing was eerie and weird and the glaciers creaking all night. <laughs> <laughs> and cracking and like lightning and thunder, but it's just thunder. There's no lightning. And uh, we're in this hotel, this old, oh, actually brand new, but half built. And it's been half built for about three years. So it's kind of funky little lodging area that was supposed to be a hotel, but it wasn't any, it was like a Bates motel. And it's like a horror film for, for like full on horror film. When it comes to fear tolerance, because when you're doing extreme sports like you, something that fascinates me a lot about it is your ability to handle extreme amounts of fear. It's not like fear of, open, you know, like you, you check your mail and you get a letter from the IRS and you're kind of like, oh, I'm a little nervous about this or you got to go talk to your boss about that raise. You're, you know, you have a little fear. The kind of fear that you've subjected yourself to is abject fear that is mission critical, meaning like one wrong move, one, you know, force of nature that you didn't calculate for and you're literally dead. So 
you obviously have done a lot of work on mastering fear. Do you think that that was a gradual process as you're a teenager, you guys are surfing kind of regular, normal waves in Hawaii and you're kind of working your way up. You have a few close calls or scrapes with fate and then you realize that you survived and you're building up courage over time or were there like a couple pivotal experiences on the water that just cured you of that fear? You know what I'm saying? Is it is it a piecemeal thing that you get little by little or did you go, oh shit, that was a 70 foot wave and I'm here to tell the tale. I'm good now. Like a kind of an awakening or an enlightenment to fear moment. Definitely piece by piece. Uh, up until 16, I was never going to surf a wave over 10 feet tall. I vowed and I hung out with these two guys that were the, uh, they didn't surf waves over 10 feet and they were professional surfers and they were the guys I looked up to. So I'm like, I'm going to be just like them. <laughs> and uh, I had a bad experience at 15. So 16 came along and a friend of mine forced me to go out again at the same spot where I had the bad experience, but he gave me the right board. A, Ten, uh, seven, ten, Sunset Point, Pat Ross, and Gun, and he gave me the perfect advice. Told me exactly how to paddle out, exactly where to sit, and all of a sudden I was catching all these waves. And all, that's where my passion started. For big, surfing was my passion since eleven. At sixteen, it became big waves. We became my passion from that one single session. But it was gradually going bigger and bigger and. Quickly, though, I got to Waimea Bay at about 18, maybe 19. I was already at Waimea. And then quickly it was, I got to get barreled. And then... Uh, Explain some of the terminology as barreled uh, and things like that. Give me like a little glossary of maybe the top five terms that you're going to use in this conversation or that you use on an ongoing basis for people that aren't familiar with surfing at the level that you are. Well, barreled is when... The wave for um, the wind blows against the wave coming forward and causes it to go hollow cylinder like. And our goal as surfers is to get inside of it. And it, you're in your own little world. You're in this vortex of just so beautiful. And if you're really deep, you can't even see out. But normally you can see either some green mountains or some cliffs or whatever's out there, some houses, and you're just working on getting there. But you're also in this moment in time that seems to stand still. And uh, it, it actually, it's weird because everybody says, how's it sound? And sometimes it goes silent. Other times it's like a fire hose and other times it's backdrafting. It's just, and the whole time you're just like, wow, it's like a most beautiful place on earth to be in the barrel. I like being in the barrel so much that I named my son barrel. I know. I know. <laughs> Who's not here today. We have, we have one, one kid, but not barrel. Yeah. What are a couple of the other terms that we, we might be covering here today? Just so people know that, that like I said, aren't some familiar. other terms. Yeah. Like um, swell and, I, I've only surfed once in my life, uh, which I'll perhaps tell about later. But. Well, with the, there's paddling surfing where we use our arms to catch the waves. Got it. And there's towing surfing where we use the personal watercraft or jet ski. Uh, there, I, I use the wave runner, the Yamaha wave runner. And the wave runner drives towards the shoreline with the wave coming. And you're on the rope 30 feet behind. And the wave runner pulls out and you go down. This was sport was created to ride waves that weren't were thought not humanly possible to catch, and then we actually implemented uh, flotation, and then now we got inflation, and now there's pretty much if the conditions are just right and you can put yourself in the right spot, almost any wave is catchable. Uh, there's certain waves once they get over sixty feet. They start moving a lot faster. So if it was a glassy day and you had a whitewater chip shot, you could probably still catch something over 60 feet. But 60 feet is kind of the cutoff where it's just a little bit too dangerous and a little bit too hard to get in the right spot. But it, everything is possible and people could paddle into waves over 60 feet. So there's towing versus paddling. Um, the swell is the swell in the ocean coming towards the shoreline. Um the barrel and mushy waves are when the and crumbly waves are when the wind is more onshore. If the wind's offshore, it creates perfect waves offshore, glassy. But if the wind's onshore, it 
creates waves that are almost unrideable, very undesirable, very choppy and crumbly and ugly, and they close out. Are um, phenomena like undertow an issue for surfers or not because you've got a wetsuit and something to hang on to and people watching? Is there ever a risk of being dragged out further than you want to be? In certain, like in Tahiti, I think in Indonesia as well, anywhere where you have a really small channel with reef on each side and then the channel comes in and then you have like a bay inside at high tide it brings all the water in and at low tide it sucks out so you could be surfing a wave right on the edge and if the current's sucking you out and you can't get into the impact zone you can get sucked out to sea um nazare there's a lot of those little river rip tide current lines that are coming out from all the water just moving forward and no place for it to go. So it has to go out somewhere. So that's why it creates peaks and each peak has a current line going through it. So it makes it really, no matter how clean it is, it's still pretty um, bumpy and challenging. When you broke the world record at Nazare in Portugal for writing the largest wave ever at 78 feet. When you were doing that, did you have a feeling that you were breaking the record? Did you have a sense of like how big that wave actually was? I honestly had no idea it was that big. And still today, I look at all of the waves that have been ridden after. And it there's so much waves that were way bigger than my wave. For some reason, they wouldn't measure them bigger than my wave. I don't know why. Um, every year after my wave, somebody got a bigger wave, bigger wave, bigger wave, bigger wave, bigger wave. Um, I had no idea it was that big and I wasn't even going to surf that day. I was 100% out there to support my friends. And then they had both lost their boards. And luckily I brought my board. Otherwise I wouldn't have ever caught that wave. And luckily I had a good team, good guys around me who encouraged me to catch one. And as I came down the wave, I got to the bottom. I was very, the truth of the story, I was super frustrated on the wave. I was having a good time, but I wanted to enter from behind into the barrel and my partners put me on the shoulder. And I was like waiting to the last second so I could get deeper. And because of where he put me on the wave, I ended up going all the way to the bottom. So when they actually measured it, you you can get the true measurement. Normally we're kind of half mid face running. You don't really get to the bottom on these waves. So because he put me where I didn't want to be, ended up measuring perfectly. And that was the only reason we got the world record wave. As I got to the bottom, I turned hard, tried to go up in the barrel and it hit me really hard. And right when it hit me, that's when I realized it was a wave of consequences, a good size wave. And then I, and I really, uh, like I said, I wasn't interested in surfing that day. So then now I'm kicking out of this wave and super excited and super amped to catch more waves. I get on the sled and I'm yelling, next wave, put me deeper. And then my wife comes on the walkie talkie because she was shipped to shore communication. And she's like, that was it. That's the biggest wave ever. We go back to the harbor. I'm just like, I'm now I'm kind of excited. I want to surf. <laughs> <laughs> and how do they how do they measure them? Are they are they are they on the shore photographing and looking at the scale of how tall you are versus that? I find that so fascinating. It's it's fascinating and very subjective and political and controversial. And there's a lot of different rules that they uh, have in place, and they change them a little bit here and there every year. Right now, they have a really good formula. Um, the only thing that's missing is the bottom of the wave. They get the top, and they figure out what the top is pretty easy. They uh, figure out how tall the surfer is, which is pretty subjective, depending if he's crouching and all these different things. They can't really tell how big the surfer is, but they figure out a measurement on the surfer and see how many times that fits in the wave from the lip to wherever they decide the bottom is. And... That's the subjective part because they're usually deciding the bottom right after the surfer. Maybe they'll put one or two. Sur- I don't know. I don't, I've never been in the, the room when they're uh, judging, but the bottom is at least another 20, 30 feet from where they're measuring at least 10, if not 20. But it's really tough because you want to measure from here to there, but the waves are sloping. So is it how 
long the slope is or how tall the wave is. And is the the height of the wave that, or is it just from the ocean floor to? Yes, it's, it's it's not scientific. It's surfers figuring out what they want. And so, technically, you held that record for what, like nine years? Yeah, eight, I think it was eight, maybe nine. Eight, yeah, eight years. The funny thing is, it's um, a lot of uh, industry people doing all the judging who are either sponsors or that most people have some kind of agenda. They have their favorites. They have their favorite waves. They have their favorite this or that. In the past, it was Billabong, an actual company who was doing all the judging so it was, or uh, overseeing it all. Now it's WSL, which is more for, the, for everybody, for the surfers. But at the end of the day, it's a company trying to... Uh, the numbers to dictate their decisions. I'm curious psychologically what happens when you have a worldly achievement like that. Um, how do you maintain some sense of humility and down to earthness when you've been put in a position now in your sport where you're the Michael Jordan or the Muhammad Ali? I mean, I'm assuming like breaking a record like that kind of puts you at the top of the food chain, at least in the sector of surfing that involves big wave surfing. You know, does that start to go to your head and you want to like, you know, start wearing gold chains, buying a you know, Rolls Royce and having a bevy of surf groupies around you? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you still be Garrett and be a regular down to earth, cool guy and not, not let that start blowing you up? Well, lucky first couple of years, a few years of my life, I was in a hippie commune. So I was pretty grounded and, and uh, humble and humility was there, but then the Irish in me and the the hunger and the focus and the desire, I could have let that really take over and just been probably the worst guy in the surfing world. But uh, luckily, I would reading some really amazing books at that time. Deepak Chopra, Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. Uh, that was like my Bible. And then my wife is just the most amazing person ever. And she's always sharing with me her views and how she feels and what she thinks. And she's 99.9% right. So I was just really lucky. I had, it's really important who you surround yourself with and really important what you feel is, you know, your heart, always go into your heart when you're making decisions and always um, think about how your decisions affect everybody around you and the world and and I'm not the best at that at all but I'm always working on it that's a definitely um working on making heartfelt decisions always so it was pretty easy for me to navigate it all I'm a leo so I love people and I love having fun with everybody and I love having conversations so all the all the love that I that portugal the whole country was just like in this crazy love affair, this um, like a fairy tale. And everywhere I go still today, it's just, it's just so much love. They're just always, oh, thank you. What you did for my country. And it's like this beautiful, beautiful, like and I, I've had to, you know, stop and hang out with millions of people. I don't know what millions, but a lot of people over the last 10 years. And, and uh, you're like, Garrett, blah, blah, blah. and I have to honestly say it. Every single time that they've stopped me, I've genuinely enjoyed being there and didn't feel like it was um, a burden or it was something like, oh, I got to get out of this lame. I was always just genuine love and genuine um, sharing information and mutual. And yeah, it's just, it's, just a, it's crazy what's transpired. I never imagined my own country showing me that kind of love or being loved by my country like that. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. And I'm just so grateful and honored. And and Portugal has always been, they ruled the world and won two thirds of the world. So they ruled the world and they ruled it through the sea. So now to have the biggest wave in the world. They they took the sea back, so they're really proud, and I'm really just honored to be any part of that. That's cool. So you're kind of the um, the ambassador of the sea for them. That kind of brought the attention back on their country and gave them a sense of national pride. Yes. Yeah. Well, when I got there, there was uh, the word that everybody was saying: "We're going to collapse like Greece tomorrow. We're collapsing." I, Greece had just collapsed, and they were collapsing next. And so everybody was just on uh, defense, like just, okay, 
you better get ready. And then this happened and they're like, wow, things are possible. Everything's possible. I'm curious as a part-time resident there, what do you think the impact of uh, drug legalization has done there in terms of crime, addiction, uh, you know, society in general? Have you noticed a, a different in the the way that that works there from what, from what I understand, and I'm no expert, but crime rates and things like this have fallen dramatically in Portugal due to the fact that they have decriminalized all drugs, if not most of them, to my understanding. I've been there for 10, nine years and I haven't seen any, like the whole time I didn't see any drugs. Uh, finally a little pot here and there, you smell it. But since 10 years ago that I haven't seen any drugs and then you don't, you know, when you go out at night or you, you're cruising around in a town, you can kind of see what's going on. And I never really see anything that resembles like a druggy area or, or there's drugs going on. Uh, it must be really amazing for the country. And I've heard only good things about it. It really baffles me that you can get a half gram of anything legally. <laughs> I'm just like, really? <laughs> Do they have, uh, is it is it like Amsterdam where they have hash bars and this kind no, of stuff? No, they're very conservative. So it's really okay. surprising that they went that route because it's one of the most conservative countries in Europe. Interesting. There's no, I mean, the, there's no terrorism. The food is amazing. It's affordable. The people are very polite and nice and first world country drinking water out of the faucets probably better than plastic bottles and uh yeah it's its best kept secret in europe which is now not a secret anymore what about the origins of surfing i'm really curious if you happen to know who the first recorded people were that surfed and where they were from and how it kind of evolved from where it first started started in hawaii hawaii is the sport of kings and only the kings could surf back in the day. And if you were in the water and you hindered a king's ride, off with your head. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. That's true how, story. That's how they valued it, huh? <laughs> Sport of kings. And were the early surfboards just kind of crude, carved out of wood, or would they make them out of? They were uh, just similar to the Elia, but they were just huge, big um, planks made out of... Uh, uh, what were they made out of? Was it, um, I want to say koa, but koa is so heavy. I think it was, they were made out of koa originally, I believe. Don't quote me on that. And they were just these massive logs, like a giant alaya board. And then they uh, started hollowing them out and they were still just logs. <laughs> what do you think... Uh appeals to you about water on on a spiritual level I'm, I'm picturing you in the barrel of one of these giant waves and you're you're hearing as you said that wind storm and you can barely see through the other end of it i imagine that this is a pretty transcendent experience especially for myself as someone who i just love the element of water so it's, it's weird that i'm not a surfer actually because i just love being in all natural bodies of water and hot tubs cold plunges i mean you know, everything. Do you ever feel like in terms of your spiritual connection to that element that you've evolved as a creature that has been in water or, or anything like that? Like, do you have any kind of deeper relationship to that element that keeps you in this sport or in the game or driving you back to being in the water all the time? Uh, you know, when we started out in Berkeley, we were skateboarding. So when we got to Hawaii at 11, it was just such a natural transition. And we didn't have much when we first showed up and we found a surfboard. My mom got us a surfboard at a yard sale. And once we got in the ocean, it was just heaven. It was like nothing mattered. And it was the most fun place in the world to be. It was like skateboarding, but on the water. And when you fell, there was no cement. So it was like this <laughs> beautiful, beautiful transition. And though, you know, and it was always just my passion. I never imagined being a professional surfer. It was really a fluke at 17 when I got lucky and uh, became a pro. But it's funny at about 25, 27, I was doing these paddleboard races 
And I'd come in from the paddle and my face would be swollen like you've never seen, like I was, uh, you know, hay fever on steroids. And, and we found out that I'm allergic to salt water. So for me, it, as long as I'm above the water and I don't eat it, it's awesome. But if I'm underwater getting pounded, my eyes just get so red, get my sinuses fill up with water and I get swollen and... And I've been known to take a lot of wipeouts because uh, I always put it all on the. I was always put it all on the line. I would just put it as deep as humanly possible. The maximum consequence for the ultimate ride, like if you make it, it's the best ride of your life. But fifty percent of the time, you're not. So I came up swollen a lot, and and would come to the beach just upside down, cups of water coming out. Um, do I feel like I evolved? I, you know, my last name, McNamara, means hound of the sea. But with that little bit of um, being allergic, it, I don't know. It doesn't feel that as natural. I love surfing. I love being above the water. And I love getting pounded too. But just that swollenness is a little challenging. That's interesting. <laughs> That's so funny that you would have that. What a weird like set set you up for a love hate relationship with something, right? It it never didn't bother me too much, except for when I come in and I never didn't wrap my mind around it, let it bother me at all. But it was there. And then speaking of getting tore up by a wave, um, you had this fifty foot wave just wreck you at Mavericks, and um, you know had an injury. I think you broke your arm and dislocated your shoulder. What? What's it like to be out in the water and water that deep and aggressive and not be able to swim? I mean, have you had situations like that where you're thinking this might be the one that I don't walk away from? We, ever since we uh, implemented the in, the flotation into the wetsuits and the inflation, it's been really comfortable, big wave riding. And all of the wipeouts that I've encountered, were I've had fun enjoyed them all that one it was the normal underwater ride and fun but then once i realized it was broken there was so much pain and uh i almost didn't make it around the rocks but luckily the jet ski came i put my hand on the sled it pulled me past the rocks and then it pounded me again um there was just so much pain and for so long that it definitely changed me and mentally because I used to not be afraid of anything and wanted to go for anything. It didn't matter what size, where, if I was there, I was going to go. Did having kids affect your, uh, uh, you know, willingness to take on risk like that? It's, definitely put me in a state where I'm choosing fear a little bit. I wasn't afraid since Alaska. Since Alaska, the fear was gone in the ocean. It just disappeared. Honestly, it was gone. Uh, now, I've gone out on a few big days and had fun. And then I've gotten a few poundings on decent sized days and had fun. But I've had a few poundings on littler days. And while I was underwater, it's, it was cold water in Portugal and I was just like, I don't know if I enjoy this. And then I had a heavy duty pounding in Fiji where it beat me bad. And I was kind of thinking, do I want to continue doing this? And that thought had never entered my mind. I never let that thought enter my mind. And it's the first time I've been wondering if I want to continue on this big wave pursuit or how... Definitely going to be more patient. It's taught me patience and I'm being super patient, happily not in the water, getting ready to be in the water. Once I'm back in, okay, so I went back in in Indonesia on the way to Portugal this year and all of a sudden I wasn't being patient. I was trying to take every wave and back to the same old Garrett, ah, hungry, got to get every wave, got to get all the best wave. And that's why I ended up breaking my feet. I, I was, my foot, I was on the way out. I'm telling myself, okay. Just coach people in the waves, have fun. You don't have to catch every wave. Just sit in your spot, wait, get one here and there and help everybody get waves. Instead, rah, I'm trying to catch catching every wave. How do you, how does water break your foot? Because I'm looking down at your foot. Those of you, yeah. um, those of you watching this on YouTube, you could, 
I don't know if you could see it. Hold it up for you too. Mm, it's pretty or, swollen and gnarly looking, but I'm trying to well, picture... there's a bunch of metal in there. Uh, how does water <laughs> break bones? Or did you hit it on your board or a rock or something? I'm just like, what are the mechanics of that? This one broke just from hitting the water. Are you serious? Yeah, right when from it first hit, And then I skip like a dolphin, like or a seal just boing boing like a ping pong ball and uh, the foot I was pulling in and somehow the board went this way and my foot stayed on the board and bent the other way I got it so there was pressure there from the sort of the um, geometry of the whole thing i just done a month of force yoga I was probably the most limber I've been in years but that wasn't very limbo I was really tight when I started that month Tell us about forest yoga. What's that it all about? It is the best yoga I've ever experienced. The main takeaway that I really love about it is the, the breathing and expanding and getting taller on every breath. Like you breathe in, straighten up, and then you let go, but you don't let go. You stay there, and then you breathe and get taller. Create more space. Let go and at every breath, you create more space and then you pick your areas. Uh, okay, my shoulder. Okay, I'm going to focus on my shoulder. Oh, my heart. I need to be more loving. Okay, focus on the heart. But wherever you want to focus on, you focus every breath into that area. At the whole time, lengthening yourself, lengthening your space between your ribs, lengthening your vertebrae. Uh, it's the best yoga I've ever experienced by far. And the thing... What she has done a million different yogas and she created her own Anna Forest. She has a book, uh, Fierce Medicine. <sighs> Highly recommend it. Ah, so Forest is a person's name. You're not doing it and in she, the forest. And she's from LA. But, uh, oh, okay. Well, that's where she kind of, I think, started her. Uh, career she, I, she, her books and i don't know if it was la we'll put it you got to read that book we'll put it in the show notes when you mentioned forest yoga i'm picturing you up in the redwoods you know and it's misty and dewy and you guys are all doing yoga out there but it's a woman whose last name is anna forest, forest. okay anna forest all right we'll put that fierce in, medicine we'll put that in the show notes um when okay so when you had that injury to your shoulder and your arm and now you have your foot and i'm sure you've had your ass beat a lot from the sounds of it by this uh big wave serving you do uh how do you manage psychologically the physical pain do you do you you know you've just been injured it's starting to throb you know we all know the sensation of getting something broken or or beat on do you disassociate from your body do you take your energy into your shoulder arm or foot what's what's like your actual kind of practice of allowing that pain to be there without making it worse. This shoulder injury was so intense with so much pain. I was so happy. The first round of doctors in Ber Ber in uh, the Bay Area gave me, I think it was oxycodones, and they gave me the biggest bottle you ever saw <laughs> and said, you stay ahead of the pain. You can take up to 18 a day. I'm just like, 18 a day. That's just what they told me. Yeah. And I told gonna, my wife, and she's like, What the hell? You're horns? gonna catch a habit. <laughs> so so but let me finish. So then I I'm happy. I'm not in because I got these things to take the pain away. I'm good. I'm gonna be back in a couple months. Yeah. I go home to Hawaii. My doctor friend there says, Garrett, you have to go get an x-ray. You just gotta double check, make sure everything's fine. I'm like, no, I don't need x-ray. So you gotta go get x-ray. So I go get an x-ray. The surgery failed. <laughs> The, there was nine pieces. It's the head shattered in nine pieces like an egg. The shaft broke off the head, put itself in its peck. It was stuck in my peck. So I got the, the shaft in the peck and the egg up here. They put the, they open it up. Oh, they didn't see the nine. They only saw the shaft off. They get there and they're like, holy shit. So they put it all back together. And I get home and they do the second x-ray or the x-ray in Hawaii. And one of the nine pieces fell the, the eight fell and one stayed up so they had to hit the doctors like we got to do it we got to operate again ah so they cut it open took everything apart took all the screws out put them all back in wrenched it down put it in and they woke up on this machine going like this I open my eyes and it's going like I get 
Did you know the movie's hostile? Yeah, yeah. I thought I was one of the hostile people. <laughs> <laughs> but they put a nerve blocker on me, so there was no pain. They, like, not block your nerve. So there's no... I was, like, freak... Oh, oh, I was, like, sweating, freaking out. And then there's no pain. It's supposed to last 18 to 24 hours. In four hours, it was off. And it was 2 a.m. And I'm in the worst pain ever in my life. And I'm screaming bloody murder. And my wife comes. I'm like, give me another nerve blocker. Give me another. And there was no doctor to do nerve blocker. I'm like, just take me up to the top. I want to jump. I mean, I seriously wanted to jump. That's how bad the pain was. I'm going to get, and she wouldn't take me up to the top. So I put a bag on my head. She wouldn't do that. Uh, the pain was so intense that I was, and I don't like pain, as you can hear from what I wanted to do. And I'm like, give me something. And they give me some statin all and some the, whatever kind of drip that none of them worked. Finally, they gave me some oxycodones. They worked. That was the only thing that would take away the pain. And uh, the doctor says, you got two weeks of these. The other doctor says, take as much as you want for as long as you want. This doctor, you got two more weeks. I'm going to start weaning you now. You take three today and two the next day or whatever. You just taper down. I was just like, there's a time and a place, for, and this is the time. And I was so depressed and in pain like you've never imagined for six months. That long? Six months. Wow. Is it because the shoulder in particular is just so slow to heal? I mean, versus breaking, you know, your forearm or some, you know, femur or something. I imagine like a, a joint injury is probably a more complex healing process than just a big ass bone that gets snapped in half and needs to be in a cast and just kind of re refuse. It's mainly the scar tissue was already setting in and uh, two surgeries in a row. I got <sighs> violated. Like tw the first one, didn't feel violated. Didn't feel violated. Felt like, cool, I'm going to get better really quick. I'm going to heal and I'm going to be back in the water six months max. Second one just took me out. I felt so violated. Felt so... It was... It broke me. Fully broke me. I would not... My wife is the only reason I came back. She... You know, we had all these amazing companies send us so many amazing supplements and she would massage me with essential oils every day and... Uh, she, she had turmeric teas and everything was just uh, the best of the best with, you know, now I'm just laying on this bed for three months and then barely walking around. I was walking around like this, like stay away. It was just stay away like this, literally. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. The show you're listening to would not be possible if it wasn't for support from our friends over at Thrive Probiotic. You can find them at thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. If you're tired of feeling gassy and bloated, like how gross is that? But we have to admit sometimes that happens. You might also be taking probiotics and supplements that suck and actually don't work and you're just wasting your money. Well, Just Thrive is the solution, my friends. Their probiotic is the first and only 100% all natural spore form DNA verified and tested probiotic supplement. As a subject of groundbreaking clinical studies, Just Thrive has demonstrated incomparable effects on the gut and its undeniable connection to the immune system and the brain. What makes these puppies awesome is this. They have 100% survivability, meaning that you take the spore-based probiotics and they actually make it through your GI tract and proliferate and thrive inside you. Hence the name Thrive. Get it? They're also vegan, non-GMO, soy-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, salt-free, nut-free, gluten-free, everything free except the stuff that's awesome. They have clinically proven strains for leaky gut, and they're also doing nine other ongoing human clinical trials at this very moment. So if you don't want to be bloated and be all gassy and leaky gutty and gross, you want to get on the Thrive Probiotics. Here's how you do it. Go to thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. That's thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. Guess what? We got a discount. Surprise, shocker. The discount's 15% and the code is Luke15. That's thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. The code is Luke15. And uh, I take this stuff every day and it's been fantastic for my digestion and my overall gut health. So I am super stoked on these guys and I'm very excited for you to try it out. That's thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. And now back to the interview. 
as I'm sure you know, most people don't even realize this, but everything in life, in our control, in the moment, is a choice. And we can choose whatever we decide. I chose not to uh, enjoy this injury, chose not to be happy about it, chose not to accept it as something that happened for a reason. The foot injury broke it, got the x-rays, woke up the next morning, didn't take any. They gave me a bunch of pain, they gave me a bunch of drugs in the Balinese hospital. I didn't take any. Um, went to surgery in Portugal a week later. Three big rup pins with, uh, f- I think, six pins, two little plates. Woke up in the morning, no drugs. They, gave, they had everything I wanted. They actually had a morphine dripper right there. I took a couple. I didn't need it. I was just no. I just went through. I chose not to do any pain pills. Chose not to uh, be a victim of this one. Chose to enjoy the pain and chose to enjoy the injury and chose to be very happy about it. People couldn't believe that I was so happy about what had happened. I, and I, I know that it it was a little bit of a lesson to slow down and be patient and help people get waves, but it was also that I wasn't quite ready to go back to Nazare. I need a little more time to get this a little further along, more range of motion. And I really enjoyed the whole process. I'm still today enjoying the process of this broken foot for the last three months. Wholeheartedly chose to love it. And I could have chose to hate every swell. I hate it every time I miss a swell, be pissed off every time a good wave's caught somewhere in the world that I could have been on, but I'm not because of my foot. Every swell in Nazare, I could have been pissed. Instead, I was happy and, and really, really wholeheartedly chose to enjoy the whole process. Do you find that it's easy for you to do that? Or do you have to call in, you know, backup from a higher power or god in order to be able to get your mind right like that i know for myself i understand the concept that life is not what happens to me it's my interpretation or my reaction to it and i really do my best to live like that Uh, for me sometimes when i experience i haven't had a broken foot but i've had broken hearts and all kinds of other broken shit a broken bank account uh and I'll want to keep a positive attitude, but it's like the needed power is not there. It's like the resource to be able to do it. I find that I'm lacking and where, where I find the power to do that is through prayer. You know, do you have a spiritual practice that helps you keep your mind right? Or do you find that you're able to just kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just be like, I'm not going to be a victim here. I'm going to control my experience by controlling the way that I perceive it. Well, definitely just recently I came to terms with God. I was a Christian forever when I was a kid up till about, I don't know, uh, till about 40. And, uh, and that was my sense of security anytime. But, you know, I was really, I usually just thanked him. I didn't ask him for much. I always thanked him. Oh, thank God. Thank you, God. Thank Because I always just got everything given to me. I worked, I don't know, I was so lucky. I always had a really amazing life. And that's the only person that would do something bad to me was myself, making a bad choice. So then I met my wife and she shared with me all the religions. And I, my whole time as a Christian, I just couldn't get my mind around the concept is that this person that I know, this most beautiful, awesome uh, selfless person I've ever met, not a Christian, they're going to hell. That does not make sense. How can that be? No, that can't be true. So then my wife uh, shared with me all the things that she's learned and knows about religion. And then I just kind of disassociated myself from all religion. And no scientific fact, there is, we are all energy, all connected. So that sat well with me. We're all part of something. So we're all part of the same thing. And I still would be in a situation where I wanted to thank somebody and I just, oh God, or, or a situation where I needed help underwater, please God. Cause I've been underwater going, please God, many times. <laughs> I, I was like, going to ask you about like, that. Please banana. No, that doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm part of this banana. <laughs> it doesn't work. So uh, just recently, actually, I've come to terms with calling 
whatever it is, God, <laughs> and wholeheartedly going, yes, please, God, or thank you, God. And just because that feels right to me, maybe because that's what I did for so long. And whether it's God or it's just energy or whatever it is, I'm happy to just call it God. And some people might think it's a false sense of security. I, it is definitely a sense of security to have somebody to talk to and, and feel and know. I'm a real believer in manifesting. So I, I, I feel that all these religious groups that got everybody thinking the same things and so much energy going towards a certain direction, things happen, you know, and you get five guys in a prayer circle, something happens. Yeah. You guys have got up strong minds. You're making it happen. Um, it sounds like your wife, Nicole has been a huge, uh, grounding element in your life. How long have you guys been together? And what do you think it was about her that, allowed you to really bond with her in the way that you have? Was there an indication from her that she would be that kind of grounding support for you early on? Or did it take time for you to really get to know her and see that? Definitely early on. Um, the one thing, like back in the day, I watched that video, The Secret. And I was just like, I'm, that's, I'm doing all that stuff right now. That was way before Nicole. So I was already really on track somehow naturally but then once i met her i always had all these visions and goals and dreams and i was doing it all pretty much myself making it all happen and when she came into my life i knew that she was the missing part of my uh, visions and goals and dreams and the love that i like she was the girl the woman that I dreamed of having my whole life. And finally I met this perfect woman, exactly what I dreamed of, whether I, and I didn't really realize it while I was in my first marriage. And, um, she is just the perfect woman and she compliments me beyond. Like I'm, I'm a discredit to her. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> but she, she she did a good job with me. She's a teacher, so I'm always getting taught new things. <laughs> and gladly, happily. I, I'm a rebel here and there, but at the end of the day, as long as I listen and as long as I'm wholeheartedly uh, present, paying attention, everything's amazing. Like amazing beyond. Very fortunate. I've noticed yeah. that many people who are really successful, not just outwardly, but inwardly, uh, part of that recipe for success seems to be a supportive, fulfilling, healthy relationship. I've met very few people that are really contented and successful on all metrics that are missing that in their life. You know, and I can tell just from talking to you, I'm like, oh, she's a really big part of what makes your life work. It, uh, it wouldn't work without her. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really what it's all about. You know, like to me, I'm like, why fucking do it if it's not that? And what you, you, know? you have a no, not right now. I don't. I don't at this current time of this recording. No, I'm single, and um, you know, you're that I'm, ladies. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, easy, easy. Uh, you know, and I'm fine with that too. I think. I think you, unless you get yeah. fine with yourself, we'll go get mom in a minute. Unless you get fine with yourself and you enjoy your own company, uh, you're probably going to pick someone based on the wrong motives and maybe be a bit desperate in so choosing. So, yeah, I'm like you know in a position where I'm open, but. Like the value I see is the value that I see in you and other people who seem to have something good going on. I go, yeah, yeah, that that sounds good. That looks good. I want that in my life. And I have at various times, of course, you know. Are you going to partake in the ceremony you're going to? Yeah, that's what I want to talk about. Have next. you so, done one? Uh, four. Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah. do you have a beautiful experience or a dark? Oh, yeah, dark? yeah. No, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what's important Amazing. In life. You know what's important. Yeah. You felt it. You love, know it. Love have is you been, important. You been, yes. You know, Number it. one. That's only thing it. that really matters. That's yeah. what we're all looking for. When it comes to plant medicines, uh, to follow up on that thread, yeah, so tomorrow uh, at the time of this recording, I'm leaving to Soltara Healing Center in Costa Rica to go through a whole week of that again. Um, and it was a positive experience for me. I'm curious what your explorations in ceremony have have been like and what you've gained from it. Hi, hi sweetie. Well, she was in the first one. She was actually present during the whole thing. My son partook and he's only feels four. But he, we gave him a little tea and he thought he was really doing it. It was amazing. <laughs> it was our family only. 
Oh, really? Yeah. Well, wow. first I did San Pedro and it was the most beautiful, best experience ever. And I was done. I didn't need to do anything else anymore. I'm, I'm good. And I know I felt what I needed to feel. I learned what I needed to learn. The only thing now is got to integrate it. If you don't do your best to integrate what you feel and learn, it's a waste of time. Some people might be able to do it just through <laughs> receiving it and doing it. Me, I got to write it down. I got to look at it every day. I'm like an old dog. You got to, you know, it takes a while to teach me a new trick. And, and so I got to focus, man, um, meditate on it every morning, afternoon and night. I've been getting the mornings down. I'm not good at the afternoons and night. I need to integrate that. And then I'll be on a really good track of integrating everything I felt and learned. Um, so... Were there any specific insights that you had from that San Pedro or from the, the following ayahuasca journeys that you had? Was there, you know, did you see where you've gone astray in your life or there were people you needed to forgive or uh, deeper access to any sort of wisdom or understandings about, about your life or what direction you might go, things like that? The San Pedro, I got there and we, we took the medicine and I was just like... I went to the bathroom and the walls started melting. I'm just like, this is lame. This is just an excuse to take drugs. What are we doing? I was kind of not happy. I was like, this is not cool. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing mushrooms or hallucinogenics. I don't need to be doing this. And then I went back to the fire and we're sitting there and the, the elders and the tribe is doing their thing. It's beautiful. But I was still like, this is an excuse to take drugs. And then I just, they told me what to do. And all of a sudden I started doing, I started focusing and breathing and accepting. And boom, I went to this vortex of love and warmth and perfect existence. It was just this vortex of the most beautiful, amazing place you could ever imagine being. And it was basically just love. And it's like energy, love and energy. And, and while I was there, I was just like, how could anybody ever want to go back to the world? I'm just like, wow, I don't think I'm going to go back. I'm going to stay. It was the most amazing place I've ever been. And then the guy comes with the water at the end and he's Poof, drink brother. Open my eyes. And there's this guy with this water. And I'm just like, and this is this little thing, and it just lasted for like eternity. And then I was back normal, and I felt that uh, my it was I was actually asking how do I, who do I serve and how do I serve were my two questions because I wasn't a Christian anymore and didn't have God, and it was just love. Love is everything. That's all you need to know, and that, that was perfect. And um, be more loving. Love every situation you get yourself into. Love it all, all day, every day, because it's a choice. Love the and broken foot. That's what I learned. I might call this episode Love the Broken Foot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll have to have a reference to waves or something. Um, well, so then they took the, the, the ayahuasca. I was not too interested in this ayahuasca stuff, but my wife wants me to, you know, figure things out, be more loving, because you're getting back to normal, go back, do something else. So we, and it was, the first one was it was a three day thing at our house. We had this amazing shaman, and uh, the first one was intense but fun and and interesting. The second one was dark, 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 dark. In, in what way? I would, oh, I went to these weird rooms and these weird places with weird things going on from way, 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 way back in the lineage of who knows how many years back. Who knows if it was me or if it was my great 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 grandfather what it was weird like it was bad and i got out of that one and went my my my, my wife looks me in the eyes and she can always help me and fix my challenges and when i'm and she's like i can't fix you this time <laughs> you're on your own <laughs> go to another one i'm like no way i'm not doing any more no way like another cup you don't go or, to another oh, three another in a seven. row oh shit so the third one i didn't even Right. Nope. And I was still all, uh, my, my heart and my head were fighting. Logic and love were just battling. And it was just a bad spot to be for three days. And then she like, there was one more, the guy was doing that like a couple of days later up the road. And I went 
and it was out of this world. Still nothing that great. I mean, nothing that I learned a lot, felt a lot, but it wasn't, I was just, I don't, I'm not into this. And then we were in Portugal about a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago. And the guy who introduced us to the San Pedro, it was his birthday and they were doing this one. It was a San Pedro ayahuasca ceremony two nights in a row. And it was like, oh, no, oh, San Pedro. Yeah, but uh, what? no. I don't, I don't. And my brother-in-law was like, come on, let's go. And my wife said, yeah, just go, go. I'm like, oh, okay. So I went. <sighs> the most beautiful, amazing loving experience I've ever experienced better than the, well, it was like the, where I went with the San Pedro the first time, but you eyes open and with this family that was just, and then they came back, they came to Portugal a month later and we went over there, did it that one too. It's next level. Just so, and, and I didn't think I needed anything more. I'm good. I just have to integrate it. I've learned, I felt, I know I don't need it. And I went and I learned so much more and felt so much more. And, and all the other times I didn't really puke just a little bit. And it puked all the way down to my belly. I mean, I still get there's a little bit left because it, it was just, wah, and I was in my intestine squeezing it out. You could see in there, I, I visually was inside just, <laughs> it was crazy, <laughs> oh, but beautiful beyond and so overwhelming, meaningful. It was, yeah. I mean, if you, it's all about who you do it with. It's all about the tribe, the people, and how they do it, and that, and yourself, because you have to breathe into it and love it. Accept, go for the ride. If it's dark, cool. If it's light, cool. Wherever you go, wow, that's interesting, interesting, interesting. And breathe. Hold on tight. <laughs> How long can you hold your breath underwater? Not that long compared to the boys these days, but four and a half minutes is about. And how did you, how did you or do you train to learn how to hold your breath when you're out in the water? Every meal, I take one big breath and try and eat it all really fast. Are you, are you fucking with no. me? <laughs> I think you never know, man. <laughs> There's a lot of different kind of breath work. Out there. Everybody believes that one. For some reason. They had me. I was like, oh, I haven't heard of this one. A new biohack. <laughs> really good for digesting your food. Yeah. <laughs> um, the whole beginning of my career, I would do some underwater rock training. I would do some laps around my school, Sunset Beach School, and, and do some hold my breath exercises, push-ups, uh, triceps, and leg ups. And that was the push-up, triceps, and leg ups were my secret to success. That's what got me through all of my... But I was in the water, always in the water, always building my lungs, always ready. And uh, there's so many new tools, so many new... Uh, amazing teachers with amazing things to offer. But Mark Visser and the Waterman's Survival Course, I believe it's called Mark Visser Waterman Survival Course or Warrior Course. Uh, what a Mark Visser's course. <sighs> Next level because it's specifically for surfing. Oh, cool. But you can also use that in every. If you got it in surfing, you're good in all other aspects of the water. And you've done some uh, the Wim Hof method too. Wim right? Hof is out of control. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, we work with Martin Sampanic, FII, our free diving instructor who had the world record for uh, deepest dive with, I think, no fins, nothing, just free dive. And he was the first guy we worked in person with. And he taught us so many amazing, just the breathing, how you breathe, to breathe up, to oxygenate your body. And then just listening to all these uh, sensations that go on in your body so you know where you're at, you know what's coming next, you know how much longer you have roughly. But a shallow water block, blackout can come at any time. You don't really know. But when you work on it a lot, you, you understand what you can handle. And Would you be bored to tears going out to... Venice and catching some puny little waves, would that be like pointless to you? Malibu, I'd be all right on a longboard. <laughs> I don't even know if they have waves in Venice. I don't <laughs> they actually, do have waves they in do? Venice. Okay. Yeah, I was just there and it looked kind of fun. Oh, yeah? If I had a stand-up board, I could have fun. Or if I was taking her, I would have a lot of fun. 
Right. But small waves aren't very interesting to me. When when the stand up came in, I I had a lot of fun on small waves finally. And then longboard, I'm not that good on a longboard, so it was really challenging and really fun to try and cross step and to, so if something's challenging and new, I really enjoy it, even if the waves aren't big. I tried surfing once down in a beach called San Onofre, I believe it's called near San Diego. And it was quite early in the day. It was pretty cold, you know, overcast. It wasn't, you know, the California dreaming, typical surf day that you'd imagine. And, uh, and with the friend, he was not a professional surfer or teacher, but he you know, kind of gave me the ropes. I think gave me the appropriate size board and, I paddled out a few times. I couldn't really get up on that thing. And I just remember getting just beat in the face by waves over and over again. And I think they were quite small waves, right? Which Beach break. Yeah. And, it's hard to get out. Yeah. Very hard. <laughs> and I, so I don't want to discredit surfing, you know, because I talk to people like you and I have many friends that are <laughs> avid, very committed surfers, you know, guys that live from here to Santa Barbara and it's just, they do it every day and they swear by it. Um, but it was sort of like, at the end of that day, and maybe it's because I, I didn't succeed, you know, and I, I didn't get up, but I thought, man, this is kind of like snow skiing, but there's no chairlift. Like every time you get down the mountain, you don't have to climb yourself back up with all your gear and then whoosh, you're back down in two seconds because I would just get my ass kicked paddling out and then just get washed into shore and beat up, you know, so I'm... uh I'm I'm curious to get back and try it again. Where would you recommend a guy like me that has an aversion to getting smacked in the face by waves, but loves water that could be, a, you know, like a location that'd be a good starting point to go give it a shot. One of, I hear one of the best places in the world. And my wife was the one who uh, shared this with me is actually where you're going. Really? Costa Rica. Costa Rica? Cause the water's warm, sandbar, soft, mellow, and there's good teachers, but get, you got to get a good teacher to take you out for the first time. And you need the biggest board possible. You want a stand-up board. You're going to want a 10 to 12 foot stand-up board. And you're going to want waves this big. And he's, whitewater beach break is perfect. For you, for those of you not on YouTube, he's you're about two feet off the ground. Yeah. Okay. With the biggest board, smallest waves okay. and sand on a sandbar. Well, I'm staying on the beach after my ceremony uh, at Sultara and I picked the beach just like, so you know, get the sunrise, sunset and all that. And I have seen that there's a lot of locals offering surf lessons there. So maybe I'll ask for a recommendation and give it a shot. Ask them for a stand-up board. Okay. To start. Okay. Say so Garrett asked to get the biggest board <laughs> right. with the smallest wave in a nice sandbar so I can just try and get my bearings straight first. And Got then once it. you get that, then you can graduate to the long board, the 11, 10 or 10 to 12 foot long board. So first day on the stand up. And once you get it, then it, you might graduate right away. Because you well, like, I used to skate you, when I was a kid. Yeah, you probably I've, graduate I've quick. I've done a lot of yoga. I have good balance. I think the day I went out and I, I gave myself like surfing a bad name just because it was probably a shitty wave day and the weather sucked and it was cold and it was just, you know. I didn't walk away from that going, ah, oh, that was fun. Yeah. But yeah, maybe I'll do that and I'll show them a selfie of us too. I'll be like, this is my regular coach. So <laughs> you guys better <laughs> step it up. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm curious about uh, um, one more thing. And this is just a strange technical question. But uh, when, you, when you were sponsored by or partnered with Mercedes, you went to Germany and you guys developed a special kind of surfboard, as I understand it. What What's different? What was that process like? And what's different about that board compared to average board you go buy, you know? The process was the a shop. dream come true. They, the, the, <laughs> in 2012, they emailed me and said, we want to pitch you on a, an idea we have. We're coming to Nazare to pitch. And we're bringing our deck. And they brought it. And they said, we don't want to just sit on the cliff in the car watching we want to get in the water with you. I'm not sure if you understand, Garrett, but Mercedes, most people don't know this. Mercedes emblem, air, land, and sea. We don't do much in the sea. We want to get back in the sea with you. So they said, we want to help you produce the magic board so you can survive, so you can come home to your family. And I, I'm in. <laughs> when do you get pitched by Mercedes? So we went, uh, like the next day on a plane to Germany brought my magic board with me and I brought my two favorites uh, there was uh, actually a, a stretch 
board and a brewer, the two, my two favorite boards. And I had made a board that was in between both of those. And I brought that board with me and we brought it to the design room. And I walk into this design room and there's a bunch of like seven foot tall Germans and just all excited. And they unveil this huge, just like a chalkboard, but it was like, like this whole room put together, actually like that and that. And they unveiled this crazy ad campaign with me and this Jetsons out so space suit with board with uh, motors and all this crazy, crazy uh, futuristic. It was just like, I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, we're going to build a surfboard. We're going to build a surfboard. These seven foot tall Germans are running around like little kids, just all excited. And uh, we figured out what would be the best recipe for the best board. And we produced it and it is by far the best board. Every single guy who was coming to Nazare the first five years after us uh, got pretty much the same board. Uh, by the produ- the production company, I le- gave them the ability to produce for other guys if they wanted them. So everybody was on the same technology. Before that board, people were not surfing. They were barely barely making the wave. Now we can actually surf the waves. Damn, that's cool. That's and cool. the Mer- Mercedes relationship is still flourishing. <laughs> Amazing. I love you, <laughs> sweetie. I know you want mama. She wants end of podcast. And I think we've just about covered it. The last you want question, some candy? The last question I have for you is uh what's next in your life? Um do you see your passion and commitment to your sport continuing on or what other projects do you have in mind other than the you know, the documentary we talked about? We started a foundation um focused on giving children I, I like to focus on a disadvantage to, to kids who don't have a chance to get in the ocean and maybe have never seen the ocean. And and uh, we started in Nazare with uh, this orphans of Nazare, foster kids that actually live on the top of the mountain that overlooks the wave. So they've been there the whole time with me. And we take them surfing or take them hiking or take them whatever the day allows or the day that we have with them uh, twice a month. And we journal with them and we share with them goal setting and road mapping. And uh, it's, we've, we've only done two sessions with them so far. It just started. First session was amazing. My brother-in-law, CJ, is running the foundation. And he's the most, uh, I don't know, a really beautiful person that's really wholeheartedly sharing whatever he feels at that moment. And, but he's super smart, like a genius. So he's just so articulate and he's really, I don't know, the epitome of a perfect man. He's the guy. Yeah. You know, and he's running the foundation and it's going really, really well. And he really loves what he's doing. He's been searching for something to do. He's like a guy who he does anything he does. He's the best. And it just falls in his lap. He was a number one in the nation in volleyball during college years for kills. And he's only 6'4". So. And, um, and he was a coach for the Italian Olympic team last year. And now he was trying, he just falls into whatever. And he was a lifeguard. We said, come, come home, to, come to Hawaii, live with us, run the preschool. So we did that for a little while. For my, we had a preschool set up at the house. And then uh, this just fell in his lap. And he saw, this feels right. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. So we got so lucky that he's, oh, running, cool. the, yeah, he's running the foundation. That's cool. Yeah, I, I had a feeling probably be answering in that way. It seems like many people, when they achieve a certain level of success, and it seems to kind of happen after 50 for some reason too, which I'm like, I don't know. I feel like I'm doing a lot to contribute myself now, but I am still getting paid for the things I do to contribute. So I'm like, yeah, I wonder when the part comes when I get into something that's more, you know, a nonprofit and that kind of thing. So that's very cool. I appreciate that. What you know? are you doing? What are some of the cool things you're doing right now? Well, man, I mean, just all the content I produce uh, based on the feedback I get from people is very transformative. You know, I spend a lot of time sharing content about spirituality, mindset, metaphysics, meditation, all kinds of biohacking and health and things like that. And most of the time, what I'm doing is really just exploring things myself, finding what works, what doesn't, and then really passing it on to people in ways that is um, 
relatable and accessible. Where some some that's the in, best when it's relatable because they yeah. come in with all these scientific terms and everything. And yeah, like, mm-hmm. and I'm you know luckily I'm like maybe just smart enough to understand the stuff, but just dumb enough to be able to explain it to people that don't want to learn the technicalities of it. Whether that be no, like that's a perfect an esoteric spiritual practice scenario. or integrating a plant medicine experience or you know getting into the science of how to fix your elbow, injecting peptides into it or whatever the case may be. You um, want to know the best way to fix any elbow? What? I got a bad one right now and I'm shooting it's peptides into it every day. In two weeks. All right. I'm listening. Finger rubber band. What? We do this our whole life. Right. You never do that. Oh, to expand? There's these little, with the connector. Yeah. You just go like that. Are you serious? Don't, it'll be gone in two weeks. Get out of here. Gone. Because I have like, I have uh, Tennis, like, app, yeah, like Apple, I think it's from the mouse yeah. all these years, honestly. And from also playing guitar and bass and having like a bend. And it's right in, in there or in here. It's more or, like on the, right uh, uh, on the outer part of the elbow joint. Anything right here. It's the fingers. Cool. Yeah. Dope. Well, there you go. Finger I, rubber bands. So I've learned, a, is there a special device or you just. Online, you'll find it. Oh, sick. They're sick. They have little. And they have three levels. I have both of them. Oh, up. so they stick on the end of your fingers? Yeah. Oh, okay. And there's a thing that connects it all the way. Oh, tight. So, so then you can do different. Done. You can, can do go it. slow both ways. And you can do that while you're driving and sitting on the Put airplane. Put it on and shit. your gear, your little uh, blinker thing yeah. or word, so you see it. Sick. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. I didn't know I was going to get done. that cured. You're, you're, all, you're cured. Much more pleasant than injecting <laughs> peptides because when <laughs> I sh- I get these insulin syringes every morning and yeah. I shoot Ooh. it in there, but man, when you hit the bone or the cartilage, it's not, it doesn't feel that hot. Uh, so you've taught me so much today, including how to fix my elbow. Who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life that people might be able to go learn from? My wife, first of all, and she's about to start sharing with people how to... Um, Sharing solutions for all the challenges they're facing, but mainly focusing on helping people reach the positive, being in their positive, which is where we all need to be to reach our peak. Deepak Chopra, definitely. Seven Spiritual Laws, all of his books I like, but Seven Spiritual Laws of Success is my Bible. Um, Anna Forrest, next level. Psst fierce medicine out of control just there's this one death meditation <laughs> you you just envision yourself 24 hours 12 hours 6 hours what are you doing what do you want to be doing and then you end with holy shit I better be doing what I just realized I'm supposed to be doing or what I want to be doing not what the world's got his claws on me that I think I need to do and have to do no but sometimes you got to go back to when you were 3 to even find out what you really were passionate about and what you really love before the world gets a hold of us. Yeah. And also going back sometimes through meditation, medicines, et cetera, to look at, for me, it's been really useful finding where like original traumas, original hurts were because you're not pissed off at the traffic ticket you just got you're pissed off from being victimized when you were two or three or eight you know what i mean yeah looking at that there's a t-shirt that uh the friend of mine that has this other place called rhythmia where i went and did ayahuasca before and um uh, it's remember the 80s the dare logo like dare just say no to drugs it's that logo but it says it's the acronym dare do ayahuasca and remember everything. <laughs> and that's really, that's, and meditation does that too. I mean, I don't think you have to do psychedelics to have that experience, but you know, it's remembering like who you are at the core and all the good, but also sometimes, you know, looking back and seeing like, where, where were those turning points that I was sent astray, you know? So man, great conversation today, dude. It's really fun to get to know you. I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, do you got any social media website or anything you want to send people to? Uh, my Instagram's always fun, McNamara underscore S. We're always trying to share uplifting good things, but a lot of it's just fun, you know, day life. But we face a lot of challenges and we love to share our challenges and love to share the solutions. We just started doing some, um, for lack of a better word, uh, vlogs, I like to call them episodes and they're going to get deep. We're just skimming the surface right now, getting into it and we'll start getting deep in the future with different things. So definitely love sharing the amazing products that we come across and really love and stand behind, but more 
just an amazing, fun life that we have and the challenges we face and the solutions we find and the people we run into both will on the Instagram and the, I don't think, but this Instagram stuff, if you got to, if you're sharing meaningful content that can provide some insight on things and share more, um, instead of just me, me, I, I, it's like, ah, it's really a challenging and it's challenging not to just, Oh, I just did this. Ah. And, that, and sometimes that's cool, but you know, it got to balance, balance. How do you ride on a private jet and not post that shit? man? Right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm supposed to jump on one in a day or two, but I might not. I got a buddy, um, my, my buddy Khalil, he owns this chain. Yeah, Khalil's one you know of my Khalil? best friends. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm supposed to jump on that jet. Okay. So Rick, yeah, he's, he's fucking hilarious. <laughs> yeah. dude, Cause he, he owns these juice places. <laughs> Um, Sun Life Organics. Sun Life Organics. And he's expanding and he's doing great. And I've always watched him on Instagram and I'm like, I know he has a few of these juice spots, but, but like private jets, I don't think people realize how expensive, mm-hmm. if, if not, not to own one, but even just to travel privately, because it's one of my goals, not so I can Instagram, but just because I hate flying and I just would like to be on a smaller plane with less people. Um, well, so when you go private, it's so hard to go back. Same with first class. Well, yeah. I'm fucked now. There's yeah. no going back. Yeah. So traveling gets very expensive. It's like I, go, I get paid to go speak somewhere and usually I eat up my fee flying myself if they don't want to pay. You know, it's a fucking disaster. But anyway, that's not the point. Back to Khalil. I love what he... So I started asking him. I would text him and be like, dude, you're you're crushing it. Like He's like, no, that's my rich friends. I don't want... I reinvest all my money into my franchise. Or not franchise, but my... um you know, my different shops and stuff. It's, oh, okay. And then he started doing his Instagram uh, feeds where he'll do a, you know, a, a feed post that has a number of images. And then it's like him and his Instagram life, you know, with some hot chicks in the Mediterranean. Well, that was Dan. Summer. He was with Dan. Oh, okay. Dan Builder. <laughs> and, then, and then like the next one will be him in his real life in some busted ass motel. And, you know, it's just funny. He does like these AB kind of reality versus Insta no, life. The busted ass hotels don't happen too often unless he has to go to Ohio. Right. And they right. Don't, might not even even have a nice hotel where he is. Yeah, so I, I, I like that where you're like doing the humble brags on Instagram, but you admit it. You know, you're like, hey, here's what it really looks like. You know, oh, he's the most real person. He's yeah. so real. Yeah, he is. That's cool. I didn't and, realize you guys were buddies. That, yeah, that makes he's sense, actually though. one of our best friends. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, listen, man, we did it. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, I look forward to watching what you're up to in the world. And Taro at Forest Maddox, we love him. He's the one who got us hooked up. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They are one of my um, longtime sponsors of the show. I made a coffee uh, this morning just for just to keep it real. I put a, a chaga and a reishi packet in my in so my good. coffee, and um, yeah. One of my favorite companies too. The funny thing is, full circle, Khalil introduced me to Taro. Taro introduced me. Oh, really? That's yeah. funny. <laughs> That's great. I love it. It's one of the greatest things about what I do, man. Is the people that I get to meet. If I was just living up here in Laurel Canyon, not having this job, I would be a very lonely man. So, thanks for keeping me company today and inspiring me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Really honored to be on your show, and uh, it'll be interesting to watch this. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. You did great. And I like that your daughter was part of the show too, which that is kind of classic. nice. And I learned that my dog, I mean, I don't think he would have hurt her, but I've never seen her like even nip or anything close to that. So Cookie, I learned your dark side today. She was being really rough. So yeah. Well, now I know. I'll, merit. I'll, I'll, be merited. My, I'll be mindful of my vicious dog. We do have that too. If you want oh to yeah. Have. And for those of you watching uh, on YouTube, this is an amazing cover to Hound of the Sea. This is Garrett's book. And it's a really, I don't want to say a harrowing tale, but it um, shows his life has had a lot of contrast. We didn't get too much into that, but you had a pretty wild ass childhood. And um, it's one of those origin stories that's really beautiful and profound. So not only does it have a cool cover, but what's inside is awesome too. So go check it out, Hound of the Sea. We'll put a link to that in the show notes too for anyone that wants to hop online and grab a copy of it. But uh, great book. Very um, highly um, reviewed also. You, know. you want to hear a funny tidbit about it? Yeah. So this cover, I mean, this is my favorite photo, but I wanted to name it. Um, okay. So I, I, 
was in the hippie commune. And that's my favorite part of the book. The first 10 years of my life was just crazy. And I wanted, I, I remember when I was like four running around in the grass field, just eating watermelons. I would just eat watermelon all day long and it would be naked, naked running around eating watermelon. And all I would look down and see watermelon seeds everywhere. And so I wanted to scribble a little naked boy with, and tile it, watermelon scenes of my ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the chapters at least. <laughs> yes. They did it. My wife vetoed it and the publisher vetoed it, but at least they put the chapter in, in there. In today's <laughs> climate, I think they were probably well advised. <laughs> uh, all right, dude. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for contributing to the world in the way you do and stay safe out there, man. We, we need you in the world. We need more insp- inspiring people. So be, be mindful and don't get yourself in trouble in those big ass waves. Thank you. All right, dude. Patience. Patience is the key. Well, thanks for riding that wave with me and our guest, Garrett. I trust that you enjoyed it. And uh, it might be the first time. No, actually, it's the second time we had a baby on the show, too. Uh, I remember it was Anya Fernald from Beloved Bel Campo over three years ago that was on the show. And her daughter was like running in and out of the room. And I remember being a little stressed out about it during the interview because I thought it was going to kind of ruin it. And then when I listened back to that one with Anya back in the day, it was actually really cute and sweet. So I can only hope that, uh, frankly, you're a nice enough person to have found this uh, <laughs> one to be the same. But no, it was, really, it was really cool. We had Cookie in here and it was a lot of fun. And by the way, if you don't know this, uh, you know, I record all of these episodes on video and now the ones that I do here in studio have three cameras, which means they're super fancy. You know, when someone's talking, it's a close up on them and it's very legit. It's very talk show. We're having an you know, Oprah moment up in here a lot of the time. So make sure to catch these uh, videos on YouTube as well. And when you get over to YouTube, uh, subscribe to my channel over there. It's not something I've put a lot of energy into building up, but now there's just so much content. I mean, there's we're going on, I don't know, 300 episodes of the podcast on YouTube. So keep in mind, if you ever want to watch these, uh, that they are there for your enjoyment. All right. So there you go. Now, I've got a ton of upcoming speaking events, but due to you know the recent uh, crisis we're facing around the world, these are subject to change, but I'll just plug them now so you know when they're supposed to be, and we'll see what happens. The first one is Cuixmala, Mexico, uh, the Healing Power of Energy Retreat, where I will be recording and live streaming and doing all kinds of fun stuff. That's uh, just such a fantastic, beautiful place down in Mexico just south of Puerto Vallarta. I went there last year. You might have seen me posting from it. It's, it's just insane. And the Quick Smala trip is June 17th through 24th. Paleo FX in Austin, July 14th through 16th. Upgrade Labs, Biohacking Conference, Beverly Hills, July 14th through 26th. Meet Delic in LA, August 8th and 9th. And finally, the, the Health Optimization Summit in London, September 12th and 13th. Man, I'm just hoping all this stuff clears up by then because these are some fantastic events and frankly I don't want to miss them like I'm I'm I was stoked to be going to these and uh, they all got pushed back for obvious reasons and uh, you know I'm only hoping that not only for this but just in general all of this kind of blows over and chills the f out for up to the date reports on uh, on the date changes and things like that, you can always visit lukestory.com forward slash events. That's where all of my speaking engagements uh, live in real time. So you can get tickets there, you can get updates on uh, changes and all that stuff. Lukestory.com forward slash events. Let's take a moment to thank our sponsors Juve Red Light Therapy. I did a session this morning. And uh, I've got a unit out in the back, you know, the, uh, the Zen Den, my little man cave out there where I meditate and do all the things. And when I came out of there, it was so cute. It was a little family juve day. I, uh, I walked back toward the house and here in the studio, there's some big glass doors uh, facing the backyard. And when I walked in, I was like, whoa, what's that light? The plants are all red out here. And I realized my girlfriend, Allison, was in here in the house doing her own little juve session too. It was just a juve family moment. Real cute and uh, real cute for our mitochondria, uh, getting rid of any wrinkles, cellulite, blemishes, uh, improving the elasticity of our skin, healing our joints, tendons, ligaments, muscles, just getting down with the red light therapy. You can find that at juve.com, J-O-O-V-V.com slash Luke. 
And uh, they're going to hook you up over there with a special gift if you use the code LOOP. Four Sigmatic Medicinal Mushrooms, Instant Coffee, all the goods, all the chronic at foursigmatic.com forward slash Luke Story. The code over there is 15% and it's called The Lifestylist. Then we've got my friends at Superfat. They have these fantastic keto cookies now. These things are freaking bomb. They've also got the little fat packs with all the healthy fats that are keto and paleo and some of them, wait, are they all vegan? I think actually they all might be vegan. I don't remember them having ghee or anything. It doesn't matter. They're healthy fats. They're tiny and super portable and hella filling. That's what I like about them. That's superfat.com. And frankly, they just have the best name for a brand ever. Super fat. Like who doesn't want super fat? Unless it has a negative connotation to you because you think about being obese or something, but that's not the kind of fat we're talking about. We're talking about like Superman fats, like super duper fats, superfat.com. So make sure that you click subscribe to this podcast on whatever app or device you're listening to my voice on right now. Just do it right now. It's the end of the show. I'm about to say goodbye in two seconds. As soon as I say goodbye, see you next week. Here's what you do. You reach down and click subscribe. Bing. All right. That's the end of the show. I'll be back in your eardrums next week. 